Welcome to the Firebelly Social Show. We're focused on talking to food and beverage brands that are on a mission to make the world better. Welcome to the Firebelly Social Show. I am your host, Duncan Olney, and we speak to leading entrepreneurs and CEOs of mission-driven beverage and food brands. And this episode is brought to you by Firebelly, which I founded. At Firebelly, we make brands more likable and profitable through social media marketing. That's all we do. It's 100% social, organic social, paid social, work with influencers, all kinds of extensive listening and engagement. In fact, we've voted one of the top 10 social media agencies in the world by clutch. Firebelly's helped clients like Netflix, Qdoba, Fiji Water, and many, many, many others transform their social media marketing strategies. If you, the listener, want to make your brand more likable and profitable, let's talk. Go to firebellymarketing.com or email us at hello at firebellymarketing.com. But listen, that aside, I am so excited to welcome Drew Hendricks today. I mean, Drew Hendricks is the founder of many companies, but the one we're talking about today is is Barrels Ahead Marketing. And Drew is just a, he is a kick-ass human being. I mean, he is, he, he, he should win awards for what a great human he is. And he's a very knowledgeable man. Welcome, Drew. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you for having me on the show. Drew, uh, you know, I mean, I've been accused of, you know, having a man crush on you before. You know, you are <laughs> you're you have great ethos in marketing, but you know, I think more importantly, you're you're a great human. And and I, can I just sing your praises that you surf and you go camping and you're a, a man of the wild and you're a great cook. Man of the wild. <laughs> <laughs> I need to rewild myself right now. Yeah. <laughs> and you're a great cook. So, you know, let's talk about Barrels Ahead. Now, Barrels Ahead, you are in the wine and craft industry, but you're actually working on the supplier side of the industry. You're helping suppliers market themselves uh, to wine uh, wineries and to, you know, craft beverage companies. Is that is that a good way to describe it? You know, it really is. It's so it's funny. We we made that we jumped we jumped supply ship we jumped ship over to the supply side midway through last year. And I guess we got to back up a little bit because I've been in the industry for about thirty years and mostly on the consumer side, selling wine, helping um, helping wineries and retail stores connect with consumers. And when we originally launched Barrels Ahead, it was right at the start of COVID, and at that time. We had, the goal was to be a, a help wineries with their direct consumer sales. And right at the start of COVID, we really lost about you know, 50% of our business in hospitality. And I had an, have another agency called Nimble Toad. So we kind of went back to Nimble Toad, got that boosted up. And then barrels ahead, starting in November, I realized there's really an unmet need on the supply side. There's so many great marketing companies with their D2C um, Efforts helping wineries get their wines online, sell their wines to consumers, but there's really nobody out there helping marketing companies connect with wineries or the suppliers connect with wineries. So we decided to refocus Barrels Ahead on that B2B marketing for a variety of reasons. One, the unmet need, and two, is a better match for our skill set. Where in the we are a content marketing firm and we help people align their online presence and content with their um, with their um, target audience. Yeah, I mean, I remember reading on your website, organic frameworks to get in front of your ideal client. That's very powerful. So let's let's uh, let's hit rewind. And you have just a tremendous ethos in the wine space. You know, let's let's talk about that. How did you go from you know a degree in philosophy and ancient Greek to becoming the 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 you know the man in wine? The man. Well, I think there's a couple other men and a lot of great women in the industry too. But the, the, you know, really, when I graduated from from college, my goal was to actually go get a PhD in philosophy. So I started college and really you know, decided to major in at a Greek. Figure I'd learn all the languages. I, I had really really lofty goals back then, and found myself graduated in San Francisco, waiting to go to the graduate program on the East Coast. So at the time, with a degree in philosophy and out of Greek, there's not much else you can do but maybe drink wine. So I got a job as a stock boy at a wine retail store. It was a local store, still there, fantastic store, San Francisco Wine Trading. 
if you're in the city and you're on the west side, there's no better place to buy a bottle of wine. But back in 93, I was a stock boy and it really, I just was then getting into wine at 21, but realized I had a pretty good palate for it and was fascinated by all the stories in the books. And the store had a little library there. And I ended up taking all the books home, read everything I could, tasted everything I could, and soon kind of graduated up to becoming the wine buyer and started writing the monthly newsletter and did that for about 10 years where I, it would be a cycle of um, taste wines for two weeks, write about the wines for two weeks, then sell the wines, rinse and repeat. And during that time, we set up a wine investment company where we um, help people buy some of these super cult wines. We'd store it for them and then resell it for them, which was kind of fun. Yeah. One of the wine auction programs. That was kind of neat. That was before um, eBay. And you and set, up, you set up the first wine auction site ever. Well, I don't know if it was the first. I, I brought a CGI script and tweaked it so that we could have a little mini auction. But it still was one auction site. And then, you know, is this is the what the, the question that I, I have to ask here because I'm I'm maybe I'm just envious and, and and have to know like on average, how many wines were you were you tasting a month? It was a it was heavily weighted in the Mondays and Tuesdays when the suppliers would come in, but we easily fill up one or two split buckets a day so that would be you know there could be days where we would taste 100 100 wines that's amazing that's amazing that is a happy job that's a happy and it, and it this predated the new um the new kind of track that people were finding there wasn't a soma certification track back then and there wasn't the w set tests or now we, now I t now I talk to people and they're w set 3 certified back then the goal was always just to get the masters of wine or be a wine buyer. It's it's very it's very much shifted back then. But being able to taste so many wines, we had four thousand SKUs at the time, and turn that over, keeping that fully stocked and having all that cross reference um, tasting every week really really just honed your palate. That's amazing. That's amazing. And from there, from there, you went on to get an MBA in entrepreneurial finance, which is again that is such a leap. You went from ancient Greek. Uh, philosophy and a couple of months of being unemployed, but with a deep understanding of why to, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't help it. That was my only philosophy joke um, to, to entrepreneurial finance. And then you started helping small independent wine stores compete online. Yep. We had a company called Vintelec. So the, at the time, and I actually, there was also another company called Simply Wine there. In the time, I think, I think that, um, the tech behind Vintelect and Simply Wine was a little ahead of where it should have been today. The goal on Vintelect is we had kiosks that we'd set up. This was before the iPhone. This was before actually being able to interact with a, with a touch screen. And the goal of, Simpl of Vintelect was to actually almost do a, um, a personal sommelier in, in the wine stores where people could get wine recommendations based on their taste preferences. And we would help those wine stores market but at the time, it was a little ahead of where people are at. Now you see there, there's a ton of ton of ton of companies out there helping um, consumers select and choose their wines based on um, algorithms and learning curves and, and machine learning. At the time, it was the technology was very nascent, and the um, the audience wasn't yet there to receive it. We had, the goal was to really target um, millennials. At the time, the millennials were just turning 21. Now they're Nice and mature in mid to late 30s and 40s. And, and now some of these companies coming up targeting millennials, they're doing it in the exact same way, but the timing's right. So that Vintelect, Vintelect was the helping independent wine store. And that we learned a lot back then, a lot about how to how to connect, um, how how to help retailers connect with consumers. And it was leveraged a lot of the work I did back in the wine store days. And I love what you're doing now, which is you've taken, um, I remember our conversation in the car one day uh, in, in Colorado, you know, on, on our way up to um, Jason Swank's uh, house in the mountains, where you just could not stop talking about wine. And I remember thinking like, this is, you are so perfectly positioned to do this. And you've literally, I mean, not you quite frankly, probably tasted 
thousands and thousands and thousands of wine. You understand the winery business. You understand the people that run these wineries. So it's an amazing service that you're now bringing to people that want to work with them and saying, hey, listen, you know, you need great content. You know, you need you need you need the stuff written. You need it written well. You need to write for the right personas. And, you know, you need uh, you need to be found. And then you need to um, get your message out there and, and take people through a funnel, so to speak. Right. So let me ask you this. What is your opinion of how social is being used by suppliers in the wine space? That's a that's a really good question. It's very it's actually it's really timely into how social should fit a B2B market content marketing strategy. And I have a lot of um, conversations with suppliers and I there's a repeated story that keeps coming up and that the, in the wine industry, it's built on a referral network. There's this old guard where you just, everybody knew everybody. It was a very provincial kind of farming community and it still is to a certain extent, which means it's also very regional. Even though we live in a global economy with a global internet, a lot of these suppliers started off regionally and they built their referral network. But the trouble right now is that that old guard's retiring. And with it, this referral network's retiring. And the new, the new people that are coming up, the sons, the daughters, the um, young college graduates, don't have access to that referral network. So with a B2B marketing strategy, your social provides um, proof that you're a human. I, I love that you said that. It offers you proof that you're human. Say that. Say more about that. That is, I think, so yeah. powerful. So that that ties into the story that I have, where um, I was talking to a client, and they're like, "Well, we just sell these widgets. How exciting can it be? No one wants to look at that on social." And they they couldn't think beyond LinkedIn. I'm like, "No, this should be on Instagram. This should be on Facebook, because your widgets, posting those widgets on Facebook shows that you take pride in it." Similar to showing pictures of your children on Facebook. The, to you, these widgets are exciting. And to those customers that might be purchasing those widgets, that's exciting to them. Yeah. I mean, if say it's filtration equipment, how exciting is a filtration, a piece of filtration equipment? Well, it's super exciting to the winer that's looking for a new one. And the fact that you would take pride in it and post it on your social media feeds shows that you take pride in it and shows that you're human and actually enjoy it. It's it's the humanity off it from two perspectives. It's the uh, orig originating humanity and it's the receiving humanity. It's like, you know, um, there's credibility in it. You know, you're building credibility for your widget and for your company that's selling widgets. And it's really not about the widget, right? It's about the, the greater problem that the widget is eliminating and the <laughs> data mind that that elimination provides. So I think there's that. And then secondly, like social is a great, great tool for revenue generation, right? And so you get in front of them. And so do you have a feel like, because it sounds like we're, 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 we're talking about the same thing. Do you have a feel like, I, I, I heard you say, you know, uh, the guarding of the relationships and the old guard. Do you ever find that this sort of like LinkedIn only approach to social is really just kind of like gatekeeping by like B2B traditionalists, you know, it's like, oh, uh, you, you, we do B2B, we don't do any B2C, you know, because B2C is so different. I mean, it's people at the core, right? People are making the decisions. It is, it is people on the core, but the type of decisions they're making are a little different. In B2B, the sales cycle is a lot longer. There's only, you, you make, it may be three, four years before the time you buy different pieces of equipment or engage in new technology. So the, engage, the the relationship has to be much deeper, deeper. versus connecting build with the consumer. It's easy to connect with a consumer with a, showing a picture of a bottle of wine, drinking in a nice um, field versus, oh, I'm going to try that because it's going to make me feel good. But connecting with a, another business and the humans at that business takes a lot more effort because you've got to connect with them on their level and their current mindset, which is usually much more... Um, it's much deeper than on a, on a on a consumer level, whereas a lot of times you're dealing with a PhD at at the at this tech company that's connecting with PhDs over at this winery in the enology lab in the in the winemaking lab. So you're getting two brilliant people trying to connect with each other, and too often they're not 
they're not speaking the same language, even though they think they are. And that through through social media, you get the, you can help kind of explain yourself beyond just the written word. And so what you're saying, Drew, is that, you know, you might be a PhD and you might, you know, be involved with two different sides of a, you know, year long decision making process, but you can use your humanity and your authenticity and your uh, sincerity to connect. Did Did I understand that correctly? Absolutely. Well, because in order for someone to do business with you, they have to know you, like you and trust you. That's and you've got to go through that entire, the journey is no more complex than that. You can talk about funnels, but a lot of times it's the funnel is first, they got to know you. So you've reached out to them. Then they got to like you. And there's no better platform than social media for developing like. And like can be, um, you know, it can, it can be visuals. It could also be in-depth articles because like happens on many different levels. And then trust is built over the, over time. And that they've continued to interact with you. And social gives you that possibility to actually connect beyond just email, beyond just, um, you know, tangential phone calls. Yeah, I love I love the the way you describe that. I mean, the, the way I'm interpreting it is content, good content that's written well or created well for the right person, you know, with the right message at the right time will lead to some kind of affinity, which will lead to some conversation. The conversation over time leads to credibility and trust. And that ultimately, if everything lines up correctly, is leading to commerce. So it's, it's but it's very carefully balanced along the way on the back of content. The whole mm-hmm. And it has to be the right content at the right time. It may not be the right time to deliver a, 32 page white paper to the person it's maybe too early in the relationship why would i want to read this they're just so you need to know you need to know where to engage with the person with the right type of content <clears throat> and then build, lead them through that um content discovery process where they may start with a little you know a, a nice little thought leadership quote on instagram that leads to a, another longer piece of content which really causes the person to want to dive in and learn about the product it's sure. interesting. It's interesting. I'm wondering in 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 your in in this in the industry of the supply side with wineries and 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 craft uh, beverage companies, was business or, or marketing and sales typically created um, created uh, conducted in the past at trade shows and big meetings? Is that where it normally happened? And so now we're seeing seeing this massive shift. And digital is not new, but it's a new opportunity for this industry it's it's a vital it's a vital opportunity it's not new but it's absolutely critical as this kind of as this referral network changes even as this old guard retires even as this referral network changes it's vital that your online presence matches your business because even if you get, even if i was to go hey duncan you got to check out this agency they're great they're the perfect fit to build, they're, they're the perfect fit to handle your pay per click you're going to look up that agency on the internet. You're going to you're going to take my word for it as a good lead, but you're going to do your own due diligence. You're not just going to call them up and hire them. And if they're online, if you Google them and two other agencies show up first or a slew of bad reviews pop up, you're going to go, "Well, thank you, Drew. That was a that was a good tip, but I'm going to continue doing my research." And a lot of times now, especially when you're dealing with a referral network, I would say, oh, you've got to go buy widgets from this this company. The person at that that I'm referring to does their research, and if they just see a sloppy website, they'll go, well, I, I'm sure the widget's okay, but I I don't have a lot of confidence in purchasing it. Correct. So yeah, yeah. Now I'm more vital than ever, and also with the with everything going virtual and no more boots on the ground salespeople, trade shows being virtual, it's all that much more important to make sure that your online story matches your offline story that's a i can understand why you call it a vital opportunity i mean it's it's not only vital but it's also exciting because you're now taking all these different components of the experience around your supplier brand and you're bringing it into an online space so whether it's energy whether it's um the spontaneity whether it's uh, you know great um scientific background or engineering or you know, or whether it's just like the right 
uh, a simple mix of, 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 of things that is helpful to your, your clients, you have the opportunity to capture that online and mm -hmm. making it cohesive, making it consistent, you know, making it um, truly indicative of what you do is not easy. I mean, and that's where, that's where you're helping these clients to make sure that they're going through all the right steps and building the right framework to get it across. Absolutely. And a lot of the stuff that I'm seeing right now really is really not just B2B. It's also B2C. It's just proper online presence and proper online storytelling. And this is a big tip for wineries as well. Story most wineries have storytelling or the idea of storytelling down pat. They, they know the importance of the story. But one of the biggest mistakes that people across the board make in their storytelling online, in their online presence, is they tell their story, but they don't tell how their story relates to the customer's story. And they need to show the customer how their product will help achieve the customer's desired story. And they don't fit the client or the customer into their storyline. That's amazing. That's amazing. I mean, I I, uh, I know that you and I are, are are blessed to be around some really great minds in the in the beverage space, and really all of us need to be talking to you about how mm -hmm. we tell our stories to our future beverage clients. You know, with uh, Darren Fox at, at Idea Marketing and uh, and Marty at ba at Bad Rhino. And uh, you know the others that are involved in the beverage space. It's 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 a it is a um, it is a challenge, as you say. You know to tell a story in a way that builds uh, relatability, right? It's like mm -hmm. we have to relate to our clients' uh, challenges. You know we have to relate to the load that they're carrying, and we've also got to tell that story simply, and in a way that's very clear. Yeah, for, it, absolutely. Like, and for a winery, since it's easier, to get, pretty much every winery has the same story. A small family-owned vineyard, great geology, beautiful, beautiful land, perfect vines planted. Come visit. You can see this great environment we've created. But you've created that environment for yourself. The land was already there, and it, that's that's actually not a story that it, most consumers relate to. Other than the fact that it's awesome, who, who doesn't want to be out on a family vineyard? But you need to relate to their story on actually purchasing that wine online. Most of them won't be ever at that vineyard. Is it going to make their dinner better? Is it going to make them more, um, is it going to impress their friends? It, there's all, there's many different reasons for buying a bottle of wine. Is it, is it going to make the date perfect? That's, that's the consumer story that your brand has to fit. Is it prestige? Is it, um, culinary excellence what what it, what is that story or for a, a b2b side you've you've developed this perfect filtration equipment but how does that help the winery in their story can they produce the wines faster cheaper with less um with less stress on the juice it, in a sense then elevating the quality of the wine which then helps them better present their story to the consumer and at the end of the day those wineries have got to go through the same process, right? They've got to go through the same process. They've got to reach the right people. They've got to have sticky and interesting content that grabs those people and, you know, builds some kind of affinity, takes them through, you know, uh, a journey to get them to their website and either make a decision to visit or go to the uh, liquor store to buy the wine or order the line on online. So I think it's interesting that while the, the timing of the piece and the trust of the piece is layered and different on the consumer side, but um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's much more compressed, I think, is, and emotional is what you're saying. Whereas on the B2B side, there's a lot more um, a criteria to look at. There's a lot more analysis that's done. You know, for example, like, you know, you buy a bottle of wine online. I, I don't think most of us are comparing shipping costs, you know, but maybe if you're shipping those widgets you were speaking of, you got to look at shipping costs, you look at delivery time, you got to look at all these things. So it's a, it's a fast. What's, what, what, uh, what, what advice do you have in general when it comes to content and people on the supplier side 
in the in the in the wine and craft industry? Like, you know, let's say, you know, three things that you would say. Three things. Well, I, I can think of one for sure. Well, let's go with you the one. <laughs> I can give more than that. The the thing the question I always ask, and there's many, this is there's many versions of this, but when you write something and you're putting on the line. You got to put yourself in the customer's shoes and say, why should I care? So why? why? Why did you say that? Reading the back of a wine label in the store, talking about the vineyards and the land, I asked myself, why should I care? How is this helping me make my life better other than educating myself about the history of your vineyard and your ones? You've got to put yourself in the customer's shoes across the board in your client's shoes and figure out what problem are you solving and why they should care about what they're reading. Because if you can't figure out a reason why they should care, it probably shouldn't be written and it should probably just be left out. That's a fantastic and very accessible way to put it. Why should the reader care? Are you, edu- are you educating them? Are you entertaining them? Are you providing them a distraction? Are you, um, are you in- inviting them to trust you? Uh, so you're you're really like the um, what was the name of the foreigner record in the in the mid '80s, the agent provocateur. You know, you uh-huh. have got to provoke your audience into uh, engaging with you, and by asking the right question, that becomes easier. So before we end, I just want to um, um, I've got a couple more questions for you, but I want to let the audience know that today's podcast was brought to you by Firebelly. We make brands more likable and profitable through social media marketing. Firebelly's helped clients like Netflix, Qdoba, Fiji Water, and many others transform their social media marketing. We'd love to help you to go to our website, firebellymarketing.com, or contact us by email at hello at firebellymarketing.com. So now back to you, Drew. Uh, there are there, You have a, an ability to take highly stressful situations and make them calm. So I'm going to use a specific example. We were in a four by four. What do you call it? A side by side, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, a little uh, razor speeder, side by side. Razor speeder in uh, you know the the back country of uh, near near Durango, Colorado, and uh, we were driving up to the thirteen thousand uh, foot high engineers pass. Engineers pass. Engineers pass, which is a iconic place and is a is on the dream list for. People who love doing this kind of thing, especially Jeep owners, I might say. Uh, and 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 uh, you're the owner of for of a Jeep, that's correct. Oh yes, uh, yes, I love love my Jeep. And it's just a, got a gladiator, outfitted it for camping, and excited to go. We're heading up to the Redwoods in, in next week. But anyways, yeah. Yeah. up over Engineers Path, that was exci- that was super exciting. You you are a your, your I, skills. Are beyond- I, had never, I had never really driven at that level, and I remember you you saying to me. You said, just focus and remember that you can do it. And then stay focused. And don't look down. Just look at the road ahead of you and, and just be in the moment. And I, and I remember I was freaking the hell out at that moment. And that calmed me down completely because it was your, your ability to, to provide sort of this like a Sherpa wisdom that, you know, like look at the road ahead of you. You know, remember that. I mean, and to me, it said like, look, you've got all these different variables around you, but you are in fact, for the most part, in charge, at least in this moment, for steering the vehicle and controlling the speed. And where does that calm come from, Drew? Like, how do you have that level of calm, man? That you and you know, you're obviously doing the same thing for the for your clients, but where does that calm come from? Where does Drew go to get that calm? Man, that's a uh, that's a deep. We, we want to go deep with that, you know. I'm a big. <laughs> I'm a, I'll, I'll I'll do this as a tip, you know. Absolutely, I am a big believer in. Um, I follow. I don't know, Paul, he's not a guru, but Wim Hof and his breathing techniques in ice bath. They've been life changing for me, and now you can look it up. But Wim Hof, so it's a series of breaths. You take twenty breaths in, twenty breaths out, and then you hold the negative breath. So there's nothing in your air, and you just hold that as long as you can and meditate on that. And I find myself getting um, in 15 minutes the same sort of um, mental serenity that I'd get doing an hour of um, meditation without using this technique. And that is that's really helped center me. And that that centeredness goes on throughout the day. 
But in that case of you going over engineer's pass, I just wanted you to look ahead because people have a tendency to go where they look. And I didn't want you to try to the to a better fit. <laughs> Man, I tell you what, when we don't, got don't look down, just look straight ahead. <laughs> don't worry your look. When we got to the top over there, or really for most of it, you know, there was a lot of, we, you know, we did not have goggles because we didn't know we were driving behind Jason Swang. Jason, if you're listening, weeks, which I know you're. Two weeks for my eyes to clear up. I was blind for two weeks. God, I thought I was in one of those alien movies, you know, where uh, Ripley and her and her crew are riding across some like crazy landscape, you know, because there's no trees up there. There's no trees. There's no, there's no vegetation or very little vegetation. And then you get to the top over there. You come across, you know, and there's that 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 one lake on the on the on the other side, which is just like beautiful lake. Um, yeah, thank you for thank you for getting me through that, and thank you for letting me drive. Frankly, I mean that was just a, you're you're exceptional. That was an amazing experience, and uh, and 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 real and really to spend what was it like eight hours? <laughs> we covered some territory. I tracked the miles, and I think we did eighty miles on that um, side that was, by side. A pretty amazing experience, you know, and um, I think and, and 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 for for the audience, I mean, like Drew Hendricks is a is a calm man. Like, look, he may have internal angst, and who doesn't? But I mean, this is a guy that you know gets you know a couple hours of surfing in before the, most of us are even awake. And when he gets bitten by a shock, he just breathes in twenty times, and he comes out of the of the water and goes to the <laughs> emergency room. <laughs> I mean, folks, this, this is a guy you want on your marketing team. I mean, I, I am in complete and utter like admiration of how you uh, are a pioneer in your space, uh, Drew. And I just I'm so thankful that you're my friend and that you have uh, you're doing what you're doing. And I, I wish you the best of luck. And hey, man, any parting words? No, thank you so much. Duncan. It's a pleasure to be on here. Just remember, everyone, be human, be human. And uh, last of all, Drew, where can they find you? Oh, yeah. You can find me on um, Twitter, Drew Hendricks. Um, Barrelsahead.com is probably the best place to figure out what we're doing. You can go to. And then I've also I, I do want to say I do have a podcast called Legends Behind the Craft, where we highlight the leaders in the wine and craft beverage industry. So I've got my own show. Duncan's been on it. Certainly a legend in the wine and craft beverage industry. So definitely look that up. Look up for the next show. We've got some great ones coming up. Legends in the wine and craft industry and it's barrelsahead.com. So email email Drew barrelsahead at uh, barrelsahead.com and you know he'll get you in, into the uh, queue to be on that uh, podcast. I think it's a it's a several month wait at this point, but you know we'll get you in we'll get you in line. So thank you, Drew. Have an amazing day and uh, thanks for being on the show. Well, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Firebelly Social Show. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.